Hi everyone, my name is Jane. I am a current PGY1 resident here at Loma Linda. I actually graduated here not too long ago, so I was in your shoes at one point. Um, I'll be discussing a little bit about evidence-based medicine, or EBM, and clinical practice guidelines. So some of the objectives for this lecture, at the end of this lecture, you'll be able to explain aspects of evidence-based medicine and its use in pharmacy practice, explain what clinical guidelines are and how they can be used to guide clinical practice. You should be able to use online resources to identify appropriate guidelines used in pharmacy practice, differentiate between the level, different levels of quality of evidence pyramid, and lastly, interpret and distinguish different grades of recommendation and the quality of evidence in clinical guidelines. So just a little introduction on evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine, or EBM, is about integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. So what does this mean? This means that we're using our analysis skills in order to make a complex and conscientious decision based on what available evidence there is, such as from literature, and also incorporating patient characteristics, situations, and preferences. It's always important to remember that um, we always want to take into account their perspective and what they want from these uh, recommendations that we'll be giving them. So why is this important? Healthcare should be individualized. Just like you and me, everyone is different and we all have different genetic components. We all have our own values. So it's always important to realize and always incorporate what the patient wants. Also, science, more specifically healthcare, is always changing and it always involves uncertainties. For example, right now with our pandemic, when we first um, got into the situation, we didn't know what types of treatment there were for COVID and they introduced hydroxychloroquine. However, um, we were unsure after all these new studies, we realized that it was in fact not efficacious, so we did pull them out. So it's always important to be updated with the latest guidelines and clinical knowledge. So I'm gonna discuss a little bit about the three fundamental principles of EBM. I have here listed for you, number one, the best evidence summaries, two, guides to confidence and estimates, and three, Evidence is never enough to drive clinical decision making. So number one, best evidence summaries. So when we make a clinical decision, it's um, always important to be aware of what the best available evidence we have out there regarding a specific topic. Um, in order to do this, effective literature search will help us to answer these clinical questions. And ideally, they'll come from a system, systematic summary of that specific evidence that we're looking for. Some of the resources that we can use to find such evidence will include primary literature, which includes original research articles such as clinical studies, clinical research. Also, we can use secondary literature to help locate these specific articles. And tertiary literature, such as drug information resources, including Lexicom, Micromedics, Dynamed, UpToDate, um, they'll always reference got um, guidelines in the and recommendations in their websites as well as clinical guidelines number two guides to confidence and estimates so there's two possible situations that you can run into when encountering some type of um, evidence in literature so first evidence is trustworthy this is um, you know you have high confidence in the data that's presented to you Second situation, there are some limitations in the evidence. For example, there might be some biases. So we're uncertain of this data that has been presented. So evidence-based medicine is a way to kind of guide us to distinguish between these types of situations, and it gives us a range of confidence between them. So what we use is called a grade approach. 
Um, this is one way that we'll assess the quality of evidence and it's used to measure the confidence in literature, which will be used to base our recommendations. Number three is evidence is never enough to drive clinical decisions. So ultimately, us as um, pharmacists, we're also healthcare providers. We, when making a recommendation, we always need to make sure that we um, look at the benefits versus risks. We want to make sure that the benefits outweigh the risks, also burdens, costs, or anything associated with these alternatives. And it's always important to consider the patient has their own unique values and preferences, like I mentioned earlier. And when we talk about these preferences, um, these are patient goals or their expectations or beliefs that they have regarding the certain decisions and the potential outcomes of these interventions. So one way that we can um, help define these types of clinical questions is called PICO framework. Um, this will help narrow down your search for more clinically relevant evidence. So P would obviously stand for patient or population. When asking a clinical question, you always want to um, ask who are the relevant patients. For example, are we looking at adolescent children who have asthma? Or are we looking at patients who are age 60 and above who have hypertension? I, which is interventions or exposures, these can be either diagnostic tests, foods. In our case, as pharmacists, we would obviously be primarily looking at drugs. It can also be surgical procedures, times, or risk factors. C is comparison or comparator. When looking at a specific intervention, we always want to see um, and compare, oh, is there harm? Is there harm in this intervention or benefit? And we'll compare it to a control or an alternative. And lastly, O is outcome. We want to know what types of consequences are there to the specific exposure and would this be helpful for society um, or in the healthcare field? Now we're going to discuss a little bit about clinical practice guidelines. So what are clinical practice guidelines? These um, types of documents include recommendations that are uh, intended to optimize patient care. It's a collection of a systematic review of evidence and assessments of benefits versus harms of alternative care options. Um, these guidelines are co composed by primary literature, including clinical studies and trials. They're based on common clinical practice as well. And these guidelines are always being updated as new literature is always being introduced. Like I mentioned, healthcare, the healthcare field is always being updated and new, new drugs and new disease states are always being introduced. So these guidelines are always adapting to these changes. So some of the components of clinical guidelines, when you read over a clinical guideline, they'll give you recommendations for specific indications and for specific populations. For example, they'll give you first line, second line options, or even like last line therapy. They'll also include specific dosing as well as monitoring parameters and adverse events that we would expect in these specific populations um, receiving these treatments. They'll also include treatment algorithms for specific disease states. Um, but it's important to remember that these, cl these clinical practice guidelines are meant to be a guide. So make sure that you are not memorizing these recommendations without actually analyzing why we are doing, um, providing these recommendations. Um, and also remember that every patient is unique and not all recommendations will be the optimal choice for certain patients. Some examples of clinical guidelines. Um, so each body or organization will have their own clinical guideline for a specific disease state. For example, there's American College of Cardiology or ACC. They will provide they will provide guidelines with for like for example hypertension or heart failure. Another cardiology 
organization includes American College of Chess Physicians, ACCP, or Chess Guidelines. Keep in mind, there's also, um, I know, a, a professional organization, ACCP, which stands for American College of Clinical Pharmacists. Uh, make sure you guys go, don't get confused with that. Um, those are two different things. There's also American Diabetes Association, which is a common guideline for diabetes. Um, American Heart Association, or AHA, is another cardiology organization. I'm sure you know Center for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease. Um, these, this is a guideline for patients with COPD. There's also Infectious Disease Society of America, America or IDSA. This is a guideline um, that provides us information for infectious disease, obviously. And National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or NCCN, is an organization that gives us guidelines for a lot of cancer diseases. And there's also a lot more organizations. This is not a comprehensive list. So how do we locate these guidelines? So the most reliable source to use to find these guidelines will be PubMed. Um, you want to make sure that you're looking for the most updated guideline. As you know, these guidelines are always being updated some once a year, some every several years. So it's important to be aware that there may be guidelines out there that when you search for them, they're not always the most updated one. So PubMed is obviously a good way to start. Some other sources that you can look for guidelines include some tertiary sources. They'll reference guidelines in their on their page, such as Dynamed, UpToDate, Lexicom, Micromedics. When you scroll down to the bottom, they'll include their references if they have any recommendations that come straight from the guidelines. However, remember that these types of sources are not always updated, so it's important for you to know that they might not be the most updated guidelines. Another source that you can use is Google. However, just keep in mind this is not always the best source, it's obviously because um, they might not have the most updated and it's such a wide network so it might be harder to find these guidelines. So we're going to discuss a little bit about um, the quality of evidence hierarchy and the grade of recommendations. So when you look at this pyramid, um, you can see as you go higher on the pyramid, it's higher quality of evidence. Um, when you go lower, it's a, it will be lower quality of evidence. Um, at the top is meta-analysis and systematic reviews. These are types of studies or it summarizes, a, it's like a systematic review of studies that summarize with results from smaller studies. This is where clinical guidelines will also fall under. Under that is randomized control trials as well as non-randomized control trials. These are types of studies that um, will compare a certain intervention with a placebo and these are obviously experimental. Under that, cohort studies, case control studies, they're more of observational studies, um, whereas um, when you go further down the pyramid, case series, case reports, these are more of descri descriptive um, cases or number of cases, so obviously they won't have that high quality of evidence. And at the bottom, we do have animal studies, simulation studies, and expert opinions. I'm not going to go super in-depth into this pyramid because you guys will cover this in a future lecture. So grade of recommendation is a way for us to measure the quality of evidence of these types of studies. So each organization that has a guideline has their own standard for grades of evidence. So the grade approach, like I mentioned earlier, is a way to assess the quality of evidence. It involves rating our confidence in the estimates of effects of the healthcare intervention, and it's used 
It's determined. It is used to determine the recommendation grade based on the strength of the evidence and the study quality. Every organization or guideline will categorize each of their grades in some type of lettering or numbering as high, moderate, low, or very low. And when looking at these grade of recommendations within these guidelines, you always want to aim to get to use the highest level of evidence when making clinical recommendations. So I have here a excerpt from the 2010 IDSA Urinary Tract Infection Guideline. Um, this is a table that's actually inside the guideline that will help you determine um, each of the recommendations and their the strength of the recommendation as well as the quality of evidence. So when you look at this chart, it explains um, how each recommendation is categorized, A being good evidence to support a recommendation for or against, B being moderate, C being poor, and followed by the strength of recommendation, it'll always be, they'll always include the quality of evidence, being how was this evidence proven by a clinical trial, whether it was randomized controlled trial or um, from a cohort study, case controlled, or even it could be from an ex expert opinion. I have here two excerpts from um, the 2017 ACC AHA Hypertension Guideline as well as the 2020 ADA Standard of Care Guideline. So you see in the ACC AHA Hypertension Guideline, it kind of gives you a more specific recommendation on each of their classes. So class one being a strong recommendation stating that um, this recommendation was found where the benefits outweigh the risk. So it strongly recommended for patients to or for providers to recommend to their patients. Class 2A being moderate, um, this recommendation is reasonable due to the benefits found that outweigh the risks. However, two, class 2B is a weak recommendation and may or may not be reasonable or can be considered depending on the patient only if the benefits outweigh the risk. Class 3 was found to be a moderate. Class 3, no benefit is found to be a moderate recommendation where it's not recommended unless maybe it will cause this patient from life or death um, because there was no benefit to benefit found that outweighed the risk and class three equals harm this is a strong recommendation that we should not um, go forth with these interventions because there were risks found um, that outweighed the benefits and on the second column, um, it is followed by a level of evidence being where did this recommendation come from, whether it was a randomized control trial, um, how many randomized control trials were actually um, used to develop this recommendation or versus was it only like a consensus of expert opinion. Same with the ADA standard, standard of care guideline. Um, this one is a little bit more simpler. It just explains to you, um, A, um, it had clear evidence where this was beneficial and it was conducted by a multi-centered trial. Um, B, it was just, it has evidence to support this recommendation. However, it came from a cohort study, whereas C, there is evidence from a poorly controlled or controlled study, and E, being expert consensus or clinical experience. So how do we use these guidelines? So when making recommendations to a physician or to your team, it's always important to reference these guidelines. Um, it gives you a good management, it gives you a good overview of the management of the conditions or the use of the intervention. You can use guidelines to answer specific clinical questions. However, um, it is important that you understand that the guidelines don't address all the uncertainties of the clinical practice and it should be only one of many strategies that can help you to improve the quality of care of these patients received. 
Make sure that you're not using these guidelines as a cookbook. Just like a chef, a chef does not follow strictly from a cookbook. They use a cookbook as a guide just to formulate their um, recipe or their creation. Um, us as clinicians, we, we can use these guidelines to help us kind of form our answer, but it's important for us to look at the big picture and look at um, what are the benefits versus risks for this patient and what does the patient want when developing these recommendations.